Well, we can get started with introductions as folks um, trickle in and um, Karen and I can do our, our origin stories. <laughs> um, and then I'd love to, uh, for those of you who are, are here attending, um, if you guys could write some brief introductions to who you are in the chat. Um, so we can kind of take a look at those as we're, um, Karen and I are gonna kind of trade off talking a little bit. Um, yeah, that would be wonderful. So um, I'll get started. Uh, my name's Amanda Montoya. I'm an assistant professor of quantitative psychology at UCLA. Um, I like to say that I grew up in the, uh, in the replication crisis. So I learned about um, the replication crisis when I was uh, in, in like my junior year of college was uh, 2011 and uh, my, my stats teacher at the time was really engaged in what was going on. And so in our, in our advanced methods seminar, we read um, the false positive psychology paper and a lot of um, the like scientific utopia papers and, and got really kind of into a lot of this um, content. And, and I was one of those um, undergrads, I think that we have learned about in the plenary session that was just like, oh, isn't this how science is supposed to go? Um, and I've never lost that um, in my kind of growing up through this system. So um, I've definitely seen the barriers to it and understand why um, sometimes we shift from that mentality of, oh, isn't this how science is supposed to be to, to kind of realizing the kind of realistic situation, situations under which science needs to be done. Um, but, uh, but it's been kind of a pleasure for me. And so, so my studies have been in mostly quantitative psychology and thinking about meta-science and how that, um, how quantitative psychology and meta-science uh, are, are really kind of reaching towards the same goals in many senses. Um, and then I will turn it over to my co-presenter, Karen. Sure. I'm Karen Rambo Hernandez. I am an associate professor at Texas A&M University. I'm in teaching, learning, and culture in STEM education, and I have a joint appointment in educational psychology in research, measurement, and statistics. And then I have to take a big breath after that because it's really long. Um, my... Intro into open science was uh, much less noble. I was, uh, I had just finished getting a paper through the publication process at a particular journal, journal and I had gone through um, probably at least two or three rounds of reanalysis of the data to satisfy reviewers. And uh, the paper was better as a result, but I was really tired and I didn't like the reanalyzation process. Um, and so on the heels of that, I was having a conversation uh, with my friend and colleague, Matt Makel, about a new project that we were gonna be starting. Um, and I mentioned to him about this long process about reanalysis and, and the paper we were gonna do is uh, involved a huge data set. And so um, it was really kind of dreading potential of having to reanalyze this massive data set multiple times. And he said, well, what if I could promise you, you only had to analyze the data one time? And I was like, I'm in. So it wasn't something noble. Um, while it's more, it's morphed into something a little bit more noble. I got into it simply because of the, um, I only have to analyze the data one time instead of multiple times and then all of the benefits that come with only analyzing the data one time. So um, yeah, so we're going to talk about open science, specifically in pre-registration and registered reports. Um, Amanda is going to do the lion's share of the talking um, and sort of getting into what pre-registration is and what register reports are. Um, what I would encourage you to do, uh, if you have questions as we're going along, to use the chat and then I'll like throw them over to Amanda or if I'm talking, she can throw them over my direction um, so that it's a little more interactive. Um, so stop us if we're like off in some world that doesn't make sense. 
So, all right. And with that, I'm going to pass it back to Amanda because she is going to get us started in kind of understanding the basics of the two. Awesome. Yeah. So we've done our intros. Um, I will introduce some of the, the basics of pre-registration and registered reports. Um, Karen's going to talk about a little bit of kind of comparing and contrasting, deciding between the two. Um, how do we think about that? And then we, we each have some kind of practical advice based on our own experiences, um, some resources, and then we're hoping to have a kind of extended Q&A um, with, with this whole group to kind of talk about what are some of the um, questions that come up in thinking about these. So um, I will get us started. Um, so essentially for, uh, for both pre-registrations and registered reports, I'll go through the what, who, when, where, why. I put what first because it seems kind of silly to talk about uh, who and before what. Um, so, so what goes first this time? <laughs> um, so pre-registration is essentially a process where prior to collecting your data or doing your research, whatever that process looks like, um, you create a public registration of your research plans. And um, when I say public, I don't necessarily mean that it has to be public the moment that you publish it. There are processes for doing uh, what's called embargoes, um, where you essentially say, okay, this is time stamped, but, um, but I want to keep it under wraps for a little while. And, and this helps with some concerns around maybe like scooping or something like that. But the main thing is that it's timestamped so that you can say, okay, I did this before I actually collected the data. And it typically includes things like your hypotheses, um, your plan for your sample size, the key variables and how they're measured and hopefully also how they're aggregated, um, any experimental conditions that you're planning on running, exclusion and inclusion cr criteria, and the analysis plan. Um, and so the, the purpose of a pre-registration is to kind of, in some ways, I don't want to say tie your hands, but also kind of tie your hands um, to keep yourself from doing uh, very flexible things, which is one of the, the biggest issues going on with the replication crisis is we think there's a lot of um, kind of researcher degrees of freedom going on. And so what this plan does is essentially um, sets you up to kind of say, okay, this is my plan, and now I'm just going to follow this plan. Um, the who behind pre-registration is mostly you and your internal team. So um, the one of the benefits of pre-registration is it doesn't have to involve the journal that is involved. Um, it doesn't, you don't need special permission from anyone to do this. You could do this for anything that you want to do within your team. So it's all kind of an internal process. Um, all of the authors who are involved in the project should approve the uh, pre-registration before submitting, um, just because you don't want to end up in a situation where one person wrote the pre-registration and then later one of the other authors is like, well, I, I think we should have done it this other way. So definitely uh, run the pre-registration by everybody who's involved in the project at that point in time. And then, um, because my experience is maybe a lot like uh, Pam Davis Keene's, um, I'm often the person who people come to later when they have data and they, they want help. Um, and one of the things that I would recommend is that if you tend to, to reach out to uh, a statistical an, an analyst or a, um, a librarian or somebody else who works on your team, but typically after the data is collected, I would recommend getting that person involved early um, and involved in the pre-registration so, um, so that they can kind of weigh in on whether or not um, the plan kind of makes sense. And uh, the when that goes on with this is this needs to happen uh, prior to collecting or accessing your data. So for some of us, we do um, uh, data collection in our lab. Some of us are working with uh, secondary data analysis. Karen has a lot of experience thinking about pre-registration and registered reports for secondary data. Uh, so she's great for those questions. Um, but basically the idea is that you want to make a plan before you do the plan. If you write the plan after, it doesn't really help you at all. Um, 
And sometimes there, there are justifiable reasons to pre-register after data is collected, but before it's analyzed. So um, sometimes, you, and I was just talking to somebody this week where um, they pre-registered a study, stuff went kind of wildly terribly wrong during data collection. It was COVID problems. Um, so they, they had the data, um, but they realized like they didn't follow their data collection pre-registration at all. And what that did is it changed the way that they would analyze their data. And I said, now what you can do is you can actually do a second pre-registration, tie it to the first one, explain what happened the first time and say, okay, this is our new analysis plan. We haven't looked at the data at all. Um, and then go from there. So, um, so there are situations in which this can, can happen, but I would recommend just in general, trying to default to um, pre-registering before collecting data or uh, accessing data if you're going for a, a secondary data analysis. And then one of the things that um, I recommend is to give yourself time to do a pre-registration. And um, I, I remember very early on for me going to workshops kind of like this and people say, oh, pre-registrations are great. You can do them in like a day. Um, and and I think that that's appealing and technically you can, but from my experience, I would say um, if you're not planning and planning a study in a day, you should probably also not write your, your pre-registration in a day. And what I mean by that is that um, if writing your pre-registration is, um, is I guess it's really the thinking through the plan. What if you do the thinking through the plan, like well before you do the pre-registration, then yeah, you can sit down and write it uh, pretty quickly. Um, they're not typically, <coughs> sorry, they're not typically terribly long, um, but uh, it's it's something that you want to put a lot of thought into. It's not something that you want to just kind of write out and then say okay because later you might regret the plan that you made. Um, so, so what I would recommend is that you can you can write it out, you can um, pass it around with your fellow authors and make sure that everybody agrees on this and think of it as time saving for later. So you're really making an investment in future you where um, later on when you are um, when you are writing about these things, when you're thinking about how, how am I going to do the data analysis, um, you've essentially just already written out how you're going to do the data analysis and then you can just follow that plan. Um, which I really quite like. I, I'm one of those people, like once the data's in the door, I'm like, okay, I wanna analyze it right now. Um, and so one of the things I really like about pre-registration is that if I've already kind of thought through um, how I'm gonna do the data analysis, then, then um, I can actually do that. And sometimes I just write a whole script in advance um, so that I can just run that uh, the day that I get the data, which is always very exciting. So where will you pre-register your research? Um, there's two kind of two primary places. One of them is um, OSF and the other is aspredicted.org. Um, I've done a little kind of compare and contrast between the two of these. Um, I would say OSF gives you a lot more freedom. There's different um, formats you can use and then you don't even have to use a format if you don't want to. There's no word count requirements. Um, one of the things I really like is that you can connect it to an OSF project. So if you're really going full open science the whole way, you know, you might have the pre-registration, later you have the data and materials attached to an OSF project, and you have the preprint. And if you're a, a, an OSF user, then all of those things can be linked together, which is, I mean, one of the huge advantages to OSF. Um, they will also allow you to embargo the pre-registration for up to four years. Um, so, so that's kind of getting at this issue of, of if you don't want that plan to be public the second that you publish it or the second that you put out the pre-registration, um, you can set an embargo and you can set the date or it will just automatically come out four years after you pre-register. Um, and this thing down here is just a, a screenshot of kind of all of the different ways that you can pre-register. One of them includes the pre-registration template from As Predicted. Um, so, so you could actually use the questions from As Predicted but on OSF if you wanted to. Um, As Predicted is uh, a little bit more aimed at experimental research. The questions are very kind of more applicable to those types of uh, questions. Um, one of the limitations that I found is that uh, it, it does have limited word count. Um, for a long time, my um, 
my default was as predicted, um, but then I ran into an issue with the word count because my, my analysis plans are often very detailed. Um, and so I ran out of words fairly frequently. Um, so I've started using the as predicted sheet in OSF as really kind of my system. And then um, as predicted uh, doesn't put a limit on your embargo. So it's private until you release it publicly. Um, and, and there are some, some issues with that, um, but, but just to know kind of what the differences are between these two. And then one of the things that I think is very cool about as predicted, I think OSF does something like this as well, um, but you can submit an anonymized version for peer review. So, um, and yeah, OSF does that too. Yeah. Um, yeah. And we have a, a couple of questions that have come up, Amanda, if we can, if you want to address those. And one of those is, do you have a, a recommended amount of time between pre-registration and starting data collection? Oh, man, that, it, it depends. It depends so much on like what you do. Um, in theory, you know, if, if you should be able to, um, once your pre-registration is published, you should be able to uh, to start doing your data collection immediately. If you're thinking about kind of major timelines, I would think about how long does it take you to plan a study and how long does it take you to plan the analyses for a study and then put those two together and that's how long it's gonna take you to think through your pre-registration. Cause that's really what you're doing is you're planning the design, you're planning the data collection, you're planning all of these parts and then you're also planning your analysis as well. One thing that I would say is that typically, um, if you're used to this process of, of getting data and then planning out your analyses as you have the data in hand, you may find that planning your analyses takes longer um, when you don't have the data at hand because um, you might ask things like, oh, is our outcome variable normally distributed? And then you just look. Um, and then if it is, then you make a decision. And if it's not, then you make a decision. But when you're doing the pre-registration, you might say something like, we're going to check if our outcome variable is normally distributed. And then if it is, this is what we're going to do. And if it's not, this is what we're going to do. So you kind of have to like garden or forking paths, the whole thing, if you're, um, if you're making a, a kind of um, strong plan. Yeah. So another question that came up was, does the pre-registration, what does it take for a pre-registration to be official? Like what counts? Yeah, um, this is, it's a kind of funny question uh, because like for you to say it's pre-registered, um, I think the big thing is that it needs to be time-stamped and it needs to be, um, oh gosh, there's a, a word for this, a persistent link. Um, to that. So sometimes people will say that something that's on like your uh, university website or your personal website doesn't count because you could just take it down. Um, but, uh, and so using these registries can be really helpful. One of the things I know is that um, journals, some journals, and we'll talk about this a little bit in, um, in the coming slides, some journals give badges for pre-registration. And I don't know that it's immediately clear from those journals what their requirements are. Um, but I think, yes, persi persistent identifier um, uh, is, and if you have, um, if you want like a badge, then you kind of have to go by whatever the journal says. Um, and I think most of the journals will say that it needs to be on some kind of formal registry like OSF or as predicted. Um, some other options are like, like if you're doing clinical trials, clinicaltrials.gov, you do like a, um, a uh, uh, it's essentially a pre-registration there as well. Great. Yeah. Um, so we had one other comment that was another pre-registration website that's really useful is the one hosted by SHRI. Uh, um, yeah. yeah. So uh, the Society for Research and Educational Effectiveness. Um, and then the other, the only other question we have so far is, um, do you know anything about pre-registration with meta-analyses? And is there a best, is there a repository for that? Yeah, I don't think that there is a specific repository for meta-analyses other than, I guess there's two kind of journals that do this more like a registered reports process. Um, and there is one of our resources that we have is um, some guidance for pre-registering meta-analyses. Um, and there's some really nice templates that are out there and some nice resources for that. 
Um, so that's in our resources page and we'll, we'll chat about that then. But I think you can pre-register a meta-analysis anywhere. Um, I don't know if there's a specific place where they're housed. I know like um, meta-archive would be for, for preprints, but I can't think of for pre-registrations. Okay, cool. So um, maybe this should have gone earlier, I'm realizing, but why, why would you pre-register? Um, one of the things that is beneficial about pre-registration is that it reduces p-hacking. So um, whether we, we think about it or not, whether it's purposeful or not, a lot of the time we're making decisions um, based on kind of what we see in our analyses, um, whether it's oh, this p-value is significant and that one's not, or um, look, this effect size is larger when I do the analysis this way. Um, there's a lot of analytical flexibility um, in the kind of current way that we're doing science. Well, I shouldn't say current because a lot of us here are probably not doing this this way. Um, but a lot of the kind of norms um, now and in the past have been to kind of analyze your data and then pick the analyses that work um, and then, and that's what you write up for your paper. And, um, and so, so pre-registration avoids that by essentially making a commitment to yourself. This is um, essentially kind of the equivalent of writing yourself a little letter and putting it in a box and then, and then later you open up the letter, right? Um, that's what my, my advisor was very much like, um, uh, why can't we just do that for pre-registration to just keep ourselves accountable? And, um, there's some benefits to, to doing it on, online as well. Um, another thing that this helps with is, is harking or hypothesizing after results are known. Um, this is just something that I think comes naturally to scientists is we want to explain why things turned out the way that they did. And oftentimes this comes with, if things don't turn out the way that we expected, we start to start thinking about, well, are there reasons I should have expected what I saw? And um, Parking uh, can be detrimental because then when we write up our research, it might seem like we said, well, I, I hypothesized this all along, when in fact the reality of the story is I thought it was going to go one way, I saw the results, I thought about it a little more, and now, now I'm kind of convinced in the other direction. And, and when we're thinking about a transparent science, we want to be representing the whole kind of process. Um, another thing that, that I would say is minorly helpful about pre-registration is that in some ways it opens the file drawer. So um, if someone is doing a meta-analysis or doing some type of research trying to understand what's the previous uh, research that's done on a topic, they can look at available pre-registrations and try to see if there are studies that were pre-registered but never run or never published um, on a specific topic. How to then go about putting that in a meta-analysis is really, really complicated and hard, and I don't really think that we've totally figured that out. Um, but the basic idea is there is that it gives us some representation of what's in the file drawer. Um, so if there's thousands and thousands of people who are out there trying to, to replicate ego depletion, for example, um, but none of those papers are getting published, then we can see that by looking at um, pre-registrations. Um, and then, Kind of similar, it, it, it's one of the things that I find really valuable about pre-registration is it, it helps us distinguish between informing versus testing theory. And this comes down to the way that we think about our hypothesis is that if we're trying to, to change theory or, or build new theory um, versus testing a theory, then that will kind of show up in the, in the way that we pre-register and write our hypotheses. And I just want to point to a, a couple places that will reward you for your hard work doing this pre-registration. Um, and there's a lot of journals that do this. I tried to pull some of the ones that are specific to education. So Emerging Adulthood, acceptable, uh, Exceptional Children, Gifted, Ch Gifted Children Quarterly, Language Learning, and Journal of Research on Education Effectiveness all provide badges. Um, so, so along with your paper, if your paper is pre-registered, then um, you get a little badge that says that your paper is pre-registered. And um, one of the things I want to point out is there are actually two badges for pre-registration. There's one that is um, essentially if you pre-registered the way that you're going to collect your data but not analyze it, um, you get the pre-registered badge. If you get um, met essentially methods and analysis all at the same time, 
then you get a little plus on your um, on your pre-registration, which I think is very cool. And then um, I think you guys have access to these slides through the OSF. And so you can look at the full list of all of the journals um, in case these are not ones that you would typically publish in. Okay, so we're going to transition to registered reports. I see a couple questions in the chat. Yeah. So we address those. Yeah, so we had one question that says, how do we teach or learn the discipline of fully planning out the analysis for pre-registration, including consideration for the full garden of forking paths? Oh, Ethan, this is such a beautiful question. <laughs> this is so lovely. It's so hard. And that's like a lot of my practical advice is like, this is so hard. This process of planning out your analyses correctly and thinking through all of these different options is really, really difficult. Um, I think this would be something that would be great to have either a hackathon or an unconference this, this week about, um, because yeah, there, there's so much that goes into this and it differs based on the type of research that you do. Um, so I'm, you know, I mostly work in, in a quantitative field. If you're a qualitative researcher, you would think about this very differently. Um, there's a lot, a lot to be considered here. I will give some practical advice on this later, I think, Ethan, but I would love to chat about, about this. This is one of my um, passions in life. <laughs> uh, yes, thanks. Awesome. I'm going to write, write that down so I don't forget. Um, excellent. So, so let's talk about registered reports. Um, Registered reports are, I kind of think about them as pre-registration on steroids, um, where it's, it's essentially the pre-registration process but integrated into the journal publishing process. So, um, so essentially what you do is you develop and design your study. So you kind of go through this process. And if you were doing a pre-registration at that point, you would pre-register for, for yourself, for your lab. Um, but with a, with a registered report, what you do is you then prepare your intro methods and analysis plan or alternatively a, a result section that just has like blanks in it. Um, and you submit that to a journal and the journal sends that out for peer review and the peer review process kind of works the same way that it does in a kind of traditional thing where it goes out to reviewers, they review but they don't have your data and you don't have your data. Nobody has your data. So they have to make a decision about whether or not this paper should be published based on um, the kind of merits of the method, the, the question, the interestingness of the question, um, and in particular, whether, um, whether they think that the, the paper will be uh, informative regardless of how the results turn out. Um, and so there's a lot of kind of upfront work that goes on in this process where there oftentimes is a lot of revision during this phase where a reviewer might say, well, there's this compound in your study, can you measure that? Um, and then you have to add a measure or change your sample size or change your analysis plan. Um, but it's all kind of collaborative and with the reviewers and before data is collected. So in theory, you will only have to uh, collect and analyze your data once, which I know Karen is a big fan of. Um, so, so that's kind of advantageous. And then if, if you make it through the, the stage one, um, peer review process, then you get what's called an in-principle acceptance, which is a commitment from the journal to publish the results of this paper, um, as long as you can follow along with your plan. Um, and uh, so far, I, I've seen very few documentations of things getting rejected later because people didn't follow their plan. Um, and then essentially, once you get in principle acceptance, then you will conduct your research as planned and then prepare the final manuscript. And then that will go back to the journal as called a stage two submission. And um, that goes back out for peer review. And at that point, the peer reviewers are not deciding whether or not this paper gets published or not. That decision has already been made. They're there to kind of say, okay, did they follow their plan? Did they make reasonable decisions based on the results of their studies? Are the recommendations clear? That type of thing. And then, um, and then after you, you're approved at the stage two peer review process, then the, the paper gets published, which is um, very exciting and cool. So who is involved in this? There's a lot more people involved in this process than, um, than a, a pre-registration. So um, you're involving your lab, you're involving the specific journals, there's the editor and the reviewers. And in many senses, this is a very like collaborative 
um, experience because you are um, working with the reviewers to make sure that the that the research is um, uh, up to snuff. And one of the things, again, I want to emphasize is that if there are people who you tend to bring in after data is collected, I would get them involved from the get go. Um, I, I am consistently the person that people walk into my office and they say, we collected this data and we don't know how to analyze it. Or we, you know, we made this design a little bit more complicated than we realized. How do we do for me mediation or moderation analysis with this? And sometimes my answer to that question is there's not a method developed. And you really don't want to end up in that situation when you have a registered report where you said like, okay, we're going to analyze this data, but didn't realize that, you know, there's no method out there for, you know, multi-level mediation with, um, you know, survival outcomes or something wild like that. So get the people involved um, from the beginning and make sure that the plan is solid before um, submitting it to the journal. And um, when you do this, it's kind of a multi-stage process, right? So, um, so we're thinking about the process of um, the of thinking about um, the different stages of pre-registration, kind of like uh, in the the pre-registration, we want to do the the stage one before we've collected data. I want to point out though that that it's very very common and often recommended to do pilot studies prior to submitting for a registered report. So um, most journals will allow for pilot data appropriately labeled to say like, okay, we did this stuff before we did the, the registered report, um, but then this part is the, the registered report. And so a lot of the time that's really helpful for thinking through your analysis plan, um, as well as making sure that your manipulation works and those types of things. So um, stage one should be timed like your pre-registration. So this should happen before your data is collected. And then um, one thing that we'll talk about a little more later is that you have to kind of account for the review time, um, which is a little amorphous as we, we many of us know <laughs> through going through the peer review process. Um, knowing how long peer review is going to take can, can be tough. Um, and so you wanna take that into account in terms of planning for your data collection. So if your data collection needs to happen at a certain time, um, this is something that requires a lot of planning, especially if you're dealing with like cohorts in um, educational studies, you need to get the kids, you know, you need to collect their data in spring um, or something, then you really wanna be planning pretty far in advance to make sure that you have the in-principle acceptance prior to collecting the data. And there have been cases where working with the journal editor, um, you know, if you know that you have a specific timeline that you're trying to meet, making sure that that's clear to the journal editor to kind of make sure that the process moves um, pretty quickly. Um, and then uh, the stage two peer review process tends to take a, a lot less time than the stage one, because really it should just be kind of a, a one, one pass. Uh, did, they, did they go through and, and say the things that they were um, looking to say? And uh, there's been some empirical work to look at this timeline. Um, the, 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 the information is a little bit limited, um, but Tom Hardwick and John E. Needies uh, tried, tried to look at this information from registered reports. And they found that um, median from in-principle acceptance to publication is about 671 days, 761 days. Um, and so, so that is essentially once you've gotten the the go ahead from the journal that's kind kind of a measure of how long does it take um to to do the research um and not surprisingly it takes about a year or two years um and the stage two submission to publication is pretty short so it's a, a median of about 187 days um and if you i think if you looked at stage two submission to like online first um then that would be e even shorter but oftentimes publication itself takes a long time of the printing presses and whatever goes on back there. Um, so yeah, so I think registered reports are in general a little bit more kind of time complex than um, pre-registration. Yeah, and Amanda, we had a question about can a stage one go through multiple rounds of review similar to a traditional publication? 
Yes, yeah, so that's very, very common, just like similar publication or, or publication, a traditional publication, if you will. Um, it's very common to go through multiple rounds of peer review um, and revise. And one of the things that I think is a huge advantage is you're revising something that hasn't been done yet instead of revising something that's already been done. And so there's a lot more degrees of freedom to fix problems um, as we foresee them occurring instead of, well, the data is already collected and, you know, there's nothing else that we can do and trying to like fix everything on the back end can often be really hard. Um, so I'll, I'll mention this a little bit later, but I think that the requests from reviewers can often be a lot more reasonable um, when we're dealing with a registered report because it's not go collect this data again better this time. Um, so instead, it's go collect it correctly the first time, um, which can be really helpful, I think. But yes, it's very common to go through multiple rounds of peer review, especially at stage one. So where do we publish these fabled registered reports? This is probably the most common question that I get when, when talking to people about this is where can I actually publish this? Um, and it's increasingly common to, to see registered reports um, and in, in um, psychology and social, I think education is kind of lumped into a mix of psychology and social sciences here. Um, but, uh, but currently there's about 250 journals that have adopted this and about 450 published registered reports. Um, and considering this started in 2013 and has really, really picked up over time, I think this is, is quite an accomplishment. A couple journals listed here that um, uh, publish registered reports in the kind of education area. And then um, one of the things that's very common is to put your stage one uh, submission up on OSF registries um, so that, that it's there kind of like a pre-registration um, and it is independent of the journal so that someone could verify your stage one submission. Additionally, um, OSF has a list of journals. So if these uh, six journals here are not the journals that you would typically publish in, um, that's totally okay. And there is a big list by OSF um, that, that lists all of the journals that accept registered reports. And I would say um, something that people might consider doing this week, uh, if you're excited about this, is um, one of the first SIPs, which is kind of the psychology uh, open science conferences. Um, there was a big letter writing campaign to choose some journals that we thought we want these journals to offer registered reports and then, uh, you know, prep and create uh, a way to contact those journals and reach out to them and say, hey, we want you to offer registered reports. So if there are journals that you want to offer registered reports, uh, these next two days is a really good opportunity to work with a number of like-minded people um, to, to work toward that even more. And then um, I wanted to share with us this tool. You guys have the link to this. Um, this is in, in beta form, so we're still kind of playing around with this, but it's a, a new database for registered reports where you can uh, filter based on a number of policies that the journal might have. So if you're looking to do secondary data analysis, uh, this will give you access to uh, which journals um, allow for secondary data analysis. Um, there's some information about uh, registered or registered reports. Um, you can look by each index or a number of different characteristics. Um, and so this is a kind of different way for searching for a journal that matches kind of your needs if you already have a study in mind. Um, and, and you guys have a link to this. Eventually this will be integrated with OSF and um, their list. So this is kind of, um, we're kind of in the middle, middle phases there for that. Cool. So, um, Registered reports provide a lot of the same benefits as pre-registration, um, but they also, in my mind, reduce publication bias um, even more than, than a pre-registration because it, if, if your study is pre-registered and you find a null result, it's still pretty hard to convince a journal to publish it. Um, whereas a registered report, um, the commitment from the journal is made prior to actually um, seeing the results. And so um, a lot of research has shown that registered reports are publishing null results at higher rates than um, traditional publications. And similarly, this is ha helping handle the file drawer problem, I think even more because the actual results get published rather than just looking at um, what has been pre-registered. And then um, in theory, if, if the review process is working correctly, then um, the, the 
quality of the research should be a little bit higher um, based on the feedback from the reviewers. Um, in general, they found that, that these studies tend to have higher sample sizes than traditional studies. Um, and I think there's a lot of kind of aspects of that, both like push from reviewer, but also buy-in from the researcher. Is like if you know that all of these participants that is going to result in a in a publication versus when you're you're running studies but you're not sure if they're going to get published, you're kind of willing to to essentially like bet more money on the on the registered report. And then um, I find this really this process really helpful is that you can cut ties with an idea if it's not working out. So but even before you're running participants, um, you can get feedback from reviewers that say like, hey, actually somebody's already done something almost identical to this, um, then you actually know that um, that you don't have to do it. And um, registered reports have also been used to incentivize um, open science practices more generally. So things like um, open data, replications, etc. And I would say this, this streamlines the review process um, by, by not having to go to a journal, get rejected, submit to a different journal, get rejected. Um, this, this whole process just looks so much easier when you're doing this in this two-stage um, system. It's different, which is scary, um, but it is uh, a little bit, I think it's streamlined. And then again, you're reducing wasted resources by if, if you're consistently running studies, but then not publishing them, um, then registered reports are a really great way to make sure that they get published. And you can even have a guaranteed publication, even if you have null results. Okay, and then I just wanted to give a kind of sense of the difference between between the review processes for these two, two types of publications. So if you have a non registered report, you're going to develop your idea, design your study, collect your data, write the report, and then peer review happens right here. And at this point, you might get a lot of questions like you need to run more analyses, your study is not adequately powered, you have to run it again with more people, um, there's a confound in your original study, you need to run another study, or this question is uninteresting and not worth exploring, don't we already know this? And these are like really, really common um, pieces that come out of the peer review process. Um, but what I want to point out is that these, these things are uh, aw awful feelings to have when we go through the peer review process. But if we could get these comments earlier, we could actually fix these problems without wasting resources. So for a registered report, you would develop and design your study and then it would go out for peer review. If, you, um, if your analyses aren't appropriate, hopefully your reviewers will catch that. They could recommend that you um, collect more people. And so this is just adding to your sample size, your initially planned sample size that you haven't yet collected. Um, they could fix the confound in your study or tell you maybe this isn't worth exploring. Um, and all of these three things would result in, in some level of in principle acceptance. And then you go for stage two peer review. There's not no comments at stage two. Um, oftentimes there are kind of suggestions for exploratory analyses, which you can often um, accept or decline. Um, and you have to make it very clear that these are exploratory because they weren't recommended prior to doing the data collection. And then additionally, sometimes we are making kind of um, stronger claims than our data support. And so hopefully our peer reviewers will point that out. Um, yes, and then I think we will turn it over to Karen, maybe do a couple Okay, mm -hmm. um, and I do want to uh, go over a couple of questions that have gone into the comments. Mm -hmm. um, one, Amanda, you mentioned a repository for registered reports or database for registered reports. Um, could you say where that is again? Yes, there is a... Um, uh, the database for registered reports, the link is really kind of a mess. So it's, it's, uh, if you look on the OSF slides, it's, it's, uh, here, this Montoya RR journal database, and then OSF also has a list. And then also, um, in the resources later, there is a Zotero list of published registered reports. And so that can be helpful if you want to look at some examples of registered reports as well. And um, another question that came up is, do you think it's worthwhile to include a discussion section in your stage one submission? Sort of saying, no matter what the results, it's important. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm summarizing quite a bit, so. Yeah, I, I've seen it done different ways. Um, uh, there, 
there are a lot of really good examples of stage one submissions out there. And if you look on the registries, you can kind of see what people tend to do. It, part, it partially depends on what the journal asks for. So sometimes they say, okay, you can't like commit to a discussion section because you don't know the results yet. Um, but what some, some authors do is they'll write some kind of parts of the discussion and, and leave some blanks for language so that they can say like, oh, well, we found more or less or no difference. Um, and they'll like put in brackets kind of the different options of language and it turns into like a little mad lib, um, which is very cool. So, so I think, you know, if you feel like you can commit to um, some language ahead of time, then you can definitely include that. Um, I would double check the submission guidelines for the journal specifically because some of them might say um, you do not include a discussion section yet. And some of them might say that you do. Um, yeah. All right. There are a couple of other questions that have jumped in. I'm wondering um, some do of the. Wanna, uh, do you want to start, Karen, and then I can answer some questions in the chat as we go? As sure. Well? Sure. That sounds good. Okay. So um, just a, a quick kind of compare and contrast with pre-registration and registered reports. Um, what is the typical length or the format for each? And a pre-registration can be as short as a single page. Um, it needs to include your data collection. And it, basically, everything goes into a method section. Data collection, um, measures, um, and I recommend also doing the analysis procedures. And I, yeah, so but it needs to have the most important piece is that it needs to have that time stamp or that date stamp um, before the analyses or the data collection happens. Um, for registered reports, the stage one registered report is shorter than a full length manuscript. Um, but I have also found that the stage one methods are more robust than a typical method section in a publication because you're having to explain what you're going to do without the advantage of having the data to do the explaining. So it, it's a little more effortful to, to do that explanation. Um, and then a stage two is the full manuscript. So it, it's very much what you would see in a, a typical submission. So what journals accept them? Um, for pre-registration, it doesn't matter. Um, you can do a pre-registration no matter what journal you plan to eventually submit your manuscript to. Um, and kind of ironically, the journals that accept register reports are the journals that accept them. Um, so those are increasing on a regular basis, but you can only submit register reports to those who have those procedures in place. So uh, the timeline, Amanda did a really nice job with this. Um, with the pre-registration, the first thing you do before you start the data collection analysis is submit the pre-registration. Then you go do uh, conduct your research and write it up, and then you submit for a peer review. A register report, you submit the stage one for peer review. You get the in-principle acceptance after some back and forth, potentially with your reviewers, um, assuming that they want the study published. Then you conduct your research and write it up, and then you submit for a stage two review. Um, and so peer review at the pre-registration phase occurs just like a normal submission. So it occurs after the full manuscript is written. Peer review for registered reports happens twice. One at the end of stage one when you've submitted and then again after the entire manuscript is written. So uh, which one's right for your study? For me, it really depends on time. If you have the time and there is a good journal to target, then I think that the registered reports are the better option. Um, but if you are right on the precipice of collecting data or it's in the very near future and it's a really time sensitive thing, then a registered report is probably gonna be a better option for you um, because you can't control how long that peer review of the stage one is gonna take. Um, so if you expect that it might interfere with your data collection, then you may want to just pre-register instead of doing the uh, registered report. Registered reports are better if you still have time to make changes to the study, um, if you can go back and tweak and get that input, um, but they both have similar advantages. Both of them make your hypotheses transparent and exploratory analyses transparent as a result. 
Um, and neither of them completely tie your hands. If something happens, um, your data don't behave like you expect them to, and you have to look at it a little bit differently, um, you can include what's called a deviation in your stage two um, submission or a deviation in your register report for the full manuscript. Um, but you just have to detail, hey, these different things happen. I've had that happen with um, the, all of the register reports I've done, there's been something that didn't go as planned. And so I had to say, okay, this was my original plan and this is what I did and this is why I did it, um, but it was really clear. And uh, I've not had that be a barrier to publication. I'm flying through this pretty quickly because I wanna make sure we can get to questions. Um, so I'm gonna pass it back to Amanda. Okay, cool. Uh, this is my, my practical advice, uh, which is mostly that analysis planning is harder than you think. Um, so to do this right, this is related to Ethan's question. Thinking through these things takes time and is very hard. And I'm, I'm watching my graduate student Tristan nod his head because he's gone through this process with me. Um, so, so planning an analysis in advance does not always mean that it's an appropriate analysis. And this is kind of an argument for um, for registered reports over pre-registration. So just because you plan to do it one way doesn't mean that it's the best test of that question. And that's one of the reasons why um, I think registered reports can be really beneficial over pre-registration is that um, pre-registration is all internal, right? And so um, you're not getting that feedback from the peer reviewers about whether or not they think that this is the right test of the question. And what I would recommend is that when you're thinking about the analyses to think about the edge cases. So what happens if things don't turn out as expected or um, what happens if, if things don't look the way that, that we expect them to? Because oftentimes it's very easy to say like, okay, if all of the assumptions of linear regression are, um, are, are met, then I'm going to do this this way and I'm going to test this question. And when this comes out significant, then I'm going to do this. Um, but there are a lot of extra steps that might occur. So um, one of the things I would, I would recommend that you think through is how measures are measured and combined. Um, so if you're in a situation where you tend to use scales, um, you also want to think about like what happens if the reliability of your scale is low? Um, do you just plow forward or do you make some adjustments and do you come up with a process for making those adjustments? Um, think about missing data, how to detect what type of missing data you have, how to handle the different types of missing data you have, um, and how much missing data would be too much missing data for you to even make any claims based on what you have. Think about your exclusion criteria. Um, one of the things that we realized while we were planning our uh, one of our registered reports is that because we're on rolling recruitment, if we have people who meet an exclusion criteria, we can actually replace them. Um, because we're just continuously recruiting. And so what we do is we check that people meet this exclusion criteria and then we still still can make it to our final N rather than having to guess about how many people will, um, will, 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 we will have to exclude at the end of the study. Think about multiple comparisons and how many tests you're doing and how to correct for um, family-wise error rate. And then thinking about positive checks. So if you're doing something like randomization, you still wanna check that there is um, some, some success of randomization or failure of randomization, having an, a manipulation check, and then thinking about what you would do if you fail that manipulation check. Um, so for example, if I'm trying to manip manipulate some variable and then I have a measure of it, um, and, and I don't see differences across groups on that, um, then that might kind of change the way that I approach the study. Um, some of my other advice is thinking about time management for registered reports. So the planning process, um, this whole process kind of operates differently. So one thing that I found is that a good time to start thinking about this is if you're in the grant writing phase. So one, having an, an in-principle acceptance for an initial study can indicate the quality of your research and the value um, to a, a grant panel. Um, and then reporting in principle acceptances at your kind of like yearly reporting um, times, that can really show the progress that you're making instead of just having like a slew of publications right at the end of your, um, your period and your grant. Um, there are a number of difficulties that can come up with the weirdness of the times. So you can have turnover in lab staff and you might wanna think a little bit more about having redundancy in your lab staff. 
Um, if you're doing this with student projects, they have deadlines, you have deadlines, and all, and all it's very hard to get all of these deadlines to line up. Um, and then thinking also about grant deadlines, which I know um, Karen has some experience with, is if you're getting near the end of your grant and you need to produce something before the end of your grant, it might not be the right time for a registered report. Um, there's a lot of different creative solutions. You can think about collecting pilot data and multiple rounds of data collection where you can collect some of the data um, and then use that as pilot data for a registered report and then plan to do kind of a second round as the kind of formal registered report so you can get started without having to um, delay. And then more redundancy if you have uh, staff turnover and thinking about working with the editors to make sure um, that the timeline for your review aligns with your plan for data collection. Um, yes, and Karen. Okay. Hey, um I just wanted to note that I have found the registered report process to be much more how I want science to be. It's much more collaborative. The, um, I feel like I'm working with the reviewers to improve the study um, instead of working with reviewers to defend what I already did. Um, so I just, I like the process a lot better. Um, and anecdotally, I have had um, a hundred percent of my registered reports have been accepted as a stage one, whereas not a hundred percent of my traditional manuscripts get accepted at the first place where I send them. Um, so I don't know that that works for everybody, but um, I have had a much higher success rate um, with registered reports on that first um, place where I've sent it. Um, also, the stage two register report or the stage two when everything's finally flushed out is really long. And so I'm running up against um, word limits for journals. So just kind of know that you're probably going to have to find creative ways to trim and move things into supplemental materials. Um, and if you're not sure if your study makes sense for a register report, ask the editor. Um, I had a, one of the register reports that's in a stage two review right now. Um, I had previously analyzed some data from the study cross-sectionally, and I wanted to connect it longitudinally for the register report, which it looked like that did not fit the guidelines of the um, journal. I emailed the editor, explained all the details, and she said, nope, this looks great. And so I just included that with my submission when I submitted the stage one report, and it was fine. Um, I'm skipping over some stuff, so I'm going to go ahead and go to the next one. Now, all of my register reports have been for secondary data analysis. So mine look a little bit different. Um, the important thing is, is that you don't peak. Um, but what I have found helpful is to try to do things <coughs> like write up the full paper um, for a conference using a different um, data set. For example, we have, um, I have a planned registered report that I want to submit using the TIMS 2019 data. Well, the TIMS 2019 data isn't available yet. And so I'm running all of the analyses um, on the 2015 so that I kind of work out all of the bugs on the 2015 data. And then when I submit the register report, I just strip out the 2015 data and I have my empty tables and figures and say, I'm going to do this with 2019 whenever it becomes available sometime this month. Um, I've also had a, um, in, in my registered reports, because I have seen portions of the data, because my data sets are so huge, I include a paragraph that's really explicit about what I've seen, where I've published it, um, and uh, I'm anonymized, of course, but trying to be as transparent as possible um, about the potential that I might have had to exposure to different parts of the data set. So, ah, it's 11 o'clock. We've been answering questions all the way along. Um, we have some common concerns. I don't know about Amanda, but I think I'm happy to hang out here a little bit into the lunch break. Um, but I'm, I know also this is, I think we're getting into the lunch break. So if people wanna go off and eat, that's totally fine. Um, but I can hang out here for 10 minutes or so. Yeah, I just want to say thanks everybody for joining us and yes, I will be happy to um, stick around and answer questions and also Karen and I will be around for the next, uh, you know, two days. Uh, 
I'm, I'm also happy to chat with anyone who's interested in, in doing a, a hackathon or an unconference about pre-registration or registered reports. And, and um, this is such a, a great opportunity to work with folks, not just um, talk at folks. So hopefully this is kind of the last um, session you go to that is mostly people talking at you. And from now on, we're, we're all ready to work together, which is really, really wonderful. Um, I'm seeing a question from Carrie about whether pre-registration can be used for exploratory studies. Karen, do you want to speak to that? Yeah, so um, yes, I, I don't see any reason why uh, pre-registration um, couldn't be used. And in fact, I think it would be a good idea for exploratory studies because it helps you to really um, flesh out what your research questions are. So just instead of um, registering your hypotheses, you would register the research questions and how you plan to address those research questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, pre-registration isn't required for everything. I think that's one thing that um, maybe we, we didn't talk about. We were just kind of assuming that everyone wants to pre-register. But, you, don't, you know, um, certain types of questions we don't need it for pre-registration and especially in, in exploratory situations where we're trying to generate more questions than we're trying to answer, then oftentimes we don't need, um, need a pre-registration because the whole goal is to start generating questions rather than um, providing concrete answers to those. But if you feel like you have a good sense of what your plan is, there's no reason not to, I feel like. Yeah, awesome. Um, other questions we saw in the chat? There's so many thank yous. It's hard to, to uh, I know the question. Yes, excellent. Cool. I'd love to chat about um, the forking paths thing further or talk about unconference or, or hackathon on that topic. Yeah. Um, there's nothing else on the floor. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I think, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm doing an unconference session on sort of design analysis, but in some ways it kind of begs the and power analysis being a part of that, but in some sense it begs the question of how do we even kind of nag navigate or kind of map that kind of massive, you know, kind of possible space for where the study could go. I think one resource that we can point to, I actually realize that even though I'm in, you know, open science champion, I need, I should actually read more registered reports to see how people did this in their stage one submissions. Mm -hmm. um, um, so I guess that leads to one simple question is do, normally when a journal publishes the in principle, when you get an in principle acceptance, because um, you said that the stage one is typically more detailed than the publication, but journals publish the full kind of stage one thing as well? Not always. And that's one of the mm. arguments for, um, for pre-registering, even mm. when you're doing a registered report. And a lot of journals will require this is essentially that you take your stage one and you submit it essentially as a pre-registration so that it's out there and available and, and, um, mm. and people can check it. Um, one of the, uh, there are some journals, though, that will publish protocols. So um, the the JMIRs of the world, <laughs> of, of which there are many, um, they actually have a specific journal that's JMIR research protocols. And if you want to do a registered report with them, you submit to that journal. And then essentially you have your choose of which of their journals um, you want the stage two to get published in. So everything goes through JMIR protocols and the stage one papers get published there, which I find really, really helpful. Um, and I think the Zotero list has a, a group of, um, uh, now I'm, I'm sharing with you Zotero. Um, there, there's a folder for uh, research protocols um, separate from the, the registered reports. So you can kind of check those out as, as seeing how people do this. And I, I find the process so, so helpful. So recently um, our lab has been preparing a registered report and I actually went through, I think it was something that David Mellor wrote um, or somebody who was at OSF and like the way the OSF people write their registered reports is, is pristine um, and was an example of one of those that had a discussion section pre-written um, but uh, actually, no, I'm realizing it was um, it was the many labs five 
which was, which was done as a registered report. Um, so I think that would have been Charlie Ebersol. Um, and so, so they had essentially the whole discussion section written out and then like, we'll add a paragraph here about such and such, depending on the results and that type of thing. And it was, it's so, um, so detailed and, and so, so much work, um, but it's really, really good work to do up front. I think it just makes the, the back end of the research process so much easier. Yeah. yeah um, in terms of the garden of forking paths, there, there's so much to think about, like even just like with one study, trying to think through all of the potentialities and what do you do? And But I, I think it's so helpful to think about it in advance because you can come up with much better solutions. Like one of the things that we realized with exclusion criteria was like, well, okay, if we have to exclude people for these reasons, you know, can we then recruit more? Um, because our study was on a rolling basis, so there's no reason we can't check if they meet exclusion criteria and then exclude them and obviously report how many people got excluded through, through those processes. Um, and one of the things we had to think about is like, how many people, like if it's like 20% of our sample is getting excluded or something like, is that, that's, that would be a lot, right? And so at what point do you say like, mm, maybe this, this is, is not, um, the right kind of process or we're not sampling the right people or something along those lines. 